Welcome to this PowerPoint. Today we'll be looking at AC 2.3, which is sociological theories of criminality. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the functionalist theories of both Durkheim and Merton. And at the same time, we're going to evaluate those theories and look at the strengths and weaknesses of both. So let's introduce you to sociological theories. They basically hold that social factors play a part in crime. So um, nurture to some extent rather than nature. Um, but it's more than that because it's how you're brought up, the conditions you live in. So sociological theories generally assume that if you've got a disadvantaged social class, then that's a primary cause of crime and criminal behaviour. And they would tend to argue that this begins in youth and that crime is largely a result of unfavourable conditions in a community, such as unemployment, single parent families, etc, etc. Now we're going to look at functionalist theories, so a, a branch of sociology, functionalism, and we're going to look at two uh, sociologists, Durkheim and Merton. And functionalists see society as a stable structure based on shared norms, beliefs and values about what's right and wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. This produces social solidarity. People are integrated into society. They feel they belong and they work as a harmonious unit. And most people within society therefore conform to its shared norms and standards and don't deviate from it. However, functionalists also hold that some crime is inevitable because in every society, some individuals aren't adequately socialised and therefore they're likely to deviate. And also society contains social groups, many social groups, each with slightly different values. So therefore shared rules of behaviour become clear, uh, sorry, become less clear. So ultimately functionists believe that some crime is inevitable, unlike this lady, Theresa May, who is clearly not a functionalist when she says there is nothing inevitable about crime and there is nothing inevitable about antisocial behaviour. A functionalist would disagree with Theresa May's view here. So we're going to start with Durkheim. Again, he's a functionalist. So basically he's saying crime is functional. It serves a purpose. His key ideas are Boundary maintenance, so try and use these terms I've put in bold when you're answering a question on Durkheim. Boundary maintenance is the idea that crime produces a reaction that unites society's members against the wrongdoer. It reminds them of the boundaries between right and wrong and confirms that their shared rules are what they believe in. So if you think of an example of boundary maintenance, what could you come up with? You need to pause here, have a think, and then I'm going to give you an example. So boundary maintenance might be the recent Me Too campaign where society has reacted against the mistreatment of women, sexualization, etc. And there's been a big outpouring against it and those boundaries have been re-established. Secondly, social change. For society to progress, individuals with new ideas have got to challenge existing norms and values. At first, this will be seen as deviance, but gradually it can change so that deviance becomes more accepted. Again, can you think of an example? If you can, pause, have a think, and then I'm going to give an example afterwards. So, example of social change. Obviously, attitudes to homosexuality used to be illegal prior to 1967 and is now uh, is now legal, uh, legal and um, gay people are treated totally equally in terms of the law in this society. Um, also, if we think about um, Nelson Mandela, given a life ser um, sentence uh, for terrorism, and then ultimately becomes the president of South Africa. And it also acts for Durkheim as a safety valve. It provides a relatively harmless way for people to express their discontent. Um, for example, uh, the sociologist Davis argues that prostitution acts to release men's sexual frustration without threatening the nuclear family. 
so it's a safety valve. Finally, Durkheim sees crime as a warning light. It indicates that there's an aspect to society that isn't working. So its function is to draw attention to a problem within society, which society can then rectify, can then fix. For example, if you had really high truancy rates across all the schools in a country, that might then indicate that there's something wrong with the edu education system. The stuff that's being taught is not relevant to the youth of that time. Therefore, they're voting with their feet. So what's your how do you rectify that? You make your curriculum more relevant so people turn up to school and see it as being worthwhile. Want of a better example. So crime is functional. It serves a purpose. But of course, it's got negative and positive sides to it. So the positives, as we've seen before, are that it helps to society to change and to remain dynamic. But the negative sides are that if you have too much crime, that can lead to social disruption. And the phrase that's used by a functionalist to describe that is anime. And anime is basically the loss of shared and dominant guiding principles. So it's normlessness. You've lost the norms of society, society has fallen apart. So the phrase anime, the word anime, make sure you are using that in any answer you're giving on functionalism, particularly Durkheim and Merton. Very important phrase. And then that links on to what Durkheim thought about punishment and his purpose of punishment. It, was, it wasn't about removing crime. Punishment's much more about reinforcing the shared beliefs, norms and values of society to say, we will not accept this. You are going against society. What you've done breaks our rules, our norms, our values. So it's a collective, um, for want of a better word, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a collective um, statement that this sort of behaviour is not acceptable within our society. So if you look, final quote for Durkheim here, he puts, crime brings together honest men and concentrates them. I think that sums up his view very nicely that, you know, crime makes society think about what's going on so it can adapt dynamically. Crime solves a function. So if we were going to evaluate Durkheim, the strengths of his theory, well, he's the first to recognise that crime can have a positive function for society, such as reinforcing boundaries between right and wrong, uniting people against the wrongdoer, etc. But there are limitations. You know, he doesn't actually look at the causes of crime, what they might be, just that it's functional, it's healthy, it's universal, it's inevitable and relative. He also suggests that crime and deviance strengthen social solidarity. But he doesn't really think about how it can also isolate people, for instance, females, the elderly, who may fear leaving their homes because of fear of crime. So Durkheim doesn't really address that issue. He also argues that a certain amount of crime and deviance is healthy for society. Well, that's all very well and good, Durkheim, but he doesn't ever indicate how much is the right amount, you know, how much crime is healthy, how much crime is unhealthy. Come on, Durkheim, give us a quantity. He also ignores issues of class and power and gender and ethnicity, which many think has a key cause or is related to criminality. And Durkheim is also suggesting that the criminal justice system benefits everyone in society by punishing criminals and reinforcing the acceptable boundaries of behaviour. However, other sociologists, particularly Marxists and feminists, um, say, well, they demonstrate actually, that not all criminals are punished equally and therefore crime and punishment benefits the powerful rather than the powerless, which Durkheim doesn't really address. And that then brings us on to another functionalist, which is Robert Merton. Merton. And really Merton is linked to his theory, which is called strain theory. 
which argues that deviance occurs when a society doesn't give all its members equal ability to achieve socially acceptable goals. So, there's Robert Merton, 1910 to 2003, and strain theory is what he came up with. So he argues that deviance results from the culture and structure of society itself. So he starts from a standard functionalist position of value consensus, which is that all members of society share the same values. There's a consensus on what is and what isn't the right thing to do within a society. But then, according to Merton, culture, especially Western culture, then starts to put great importance to the value of things like competition and wealth and success. And Merton argues that because members of society are placed in different positions in the social structure, either you know they're in a different class position, upper class, middle class, working class, etc. What actually happens is they don't have the same opportunity of realizing the same shared values. If you're born, if you are born in a relatively wealthy house, um, you, you know your mum, your dad earn a fair bit of money. There's money isn't tight. When it comes to I don't know, your GCSEs, your, your A-levels, your parents are more likely to be able to afford revision guides for you, uh, maybe get a, a personal tutor in to help you get through those exams. Whereas if you're a working class student whose parents are on the breadline, can't afford that sort of th a thing, you are disadvantaged because of the situation you are in in society. And Merton believes that these sort of situations can generate anomie and deviance, and this is what he refers to as strain theory. So let's explore this in a bit more depth, okay? Remember, strain theory is particularly related to Western culture, and particularly for Merton, the American culture. So Merton highlights that there's a strain between the cultural goals of society and the legitimate means to achieve these goals, you know, doing it legally. So, for example, our goal might be a big house. Our means of getting there would be education, which gives us money. And of course, those who are at the bottom of the ladder find it hardest to succeed. Therefore, they are the ones that are much more likely to seek alternative routes to gain this or this. this picture of ex-Prime Minister David Cameron, you know, a multi-millionaire, his dad was a millionaire, and then the disempowered youth behind giving him the signal with the mimicked gun shows the difference between the advantage and the disadvantage within society. So as I said, Merton observes American culture. And he said that this society bought into what he called the American dream having a successful career, lots of money, material possessions, nice family, etc, etc. And Merton said that in a balanced society, everyone will be happy. However, for Merton, American society isn't balanced. So when people struggle to live up to society's norms and values, they try and find other ways of achieving this success and act normlessly. So Merton calls this a strain to anime, and it's this normless behaviour which he said caused crime in society. So the way to think about it is consider it like someone losing in a card game, and the expectation of them is so high that they break the rules in order to do so. So basically, let's remind ourselves about what value consensus is, that society's shared norms and values. As Merton says, some people will buy into that value consensus because they're able to achieve it via legitimate means because of how they are in society. So to give you an example, and this is a bit flippant, but um, a bit of humour here, hopefully. You know, this guy here, I've got qualifications, I've got a steady job, I'm married, he is going to buy into the value consensus. Whereas this lad here, I haven't got GCSEs, my whole family's out of work and I'm ginger might not be buying in to the value consensus. 
So Merton then goes on to identify five ways in which individuals may respond to the strain between goals and the means of achieving them in society. That's why it's called strain theory. You are, you are under pressure to conform to society's goals, to achieve its goals. At the same time, you may not be able to do it, so you are under stress and strain. And Merton's argument is that some people, because they're trying to pursue these goals, will result in crime because they can't get it by the normal ways, the norm, um, can't do it through society's norms. So the first, and what I would say is you need to know all five of these um, terms here and understand them. So hopefully I've illustrated these um, effectively for you. So the first way that people respond is conformity. Members of society conform to the norms of the rest of society, which in Western society, Merton says, is the need for material goods. And they try to achieve success through normal means. So they work hard at school, etc. And for Merton, this is the most common response. So basically, you've got this lad here going, if I knuckle down and stick at it, I'm bound to get an A star in criminology. You work hard, that allows you to get good qualification, that allows you to get a good job, that allows you to earn money, that allows you to have a nice house, nice car, and achieve the things that society says are important, particularly Western society, a material society. Secondly, we've got ritualism. And ritualists reject the, goal, the goals that go along with the institutionalised means, such as work and school. Um, and this deviant behaviour results from being strongly socialised to conform to expected behaviours, even though you're not really buying into it. So it's like this, really, you know, this uh, lovely character from um, Little Britain. You know, my job's doing my head in and there's bills to be paid, but really you don't want to be there. But you conform because that's the accepted thing to do. You're going through the motions, you're going through the rituals of things. You're not doing it because you want to, you're doing it almost because it's what society expects, but you don't buy into it. So it's that choice, isn't it? A full-time boring job where I can chill for hours or a full-time exhausting job where I can develop myself in a professional way. So um, they're going for the uh, full-time boring job where they just do the full-time boring job and that's it. Thirdly, we have innovation. That's a commitment to the cultural goals remain strong, but they reject the conventional means of getting the wealth and turn to illegal means such as theft and fraud. So your innovators will be people like this. I'm heading to the top and I don't care how many dead bodies I have to climb over to get there. Our next category from Merton is retreatism. Merton says you'll always have a small number of people who reject the goals and means of society and drop out of society altogether. He often um, said that these people will take up alcohol and drugs, but not always. So an example would be this, you know, let's go and get totally trashed. Dave, have you got any weed? Dave, Dave, can you hear me? No, Dave can't hear you because he's completely trashed. Or alternatively, you know, you've got this idea of dropping out of society, you go off and live in a hippie commune far away from the societal norms. And finally, Merton proposes rebellion. Some people may rebel, try to replace those shared goals and institutional means with much more radical alternatives. And Merton says they'll often use violent methods to achieve this, so full on anarchy. So workers of the world unite you've got nothing to lose but your chains as these privileged white americans for some reason riot god knows why but of course it's very important to take a selfie as you're doing it so capitalism is without a doubt linked to merton's strain theory this idea that at the top the super rich are doing very well middle class not so bad and the poor of course are falling through at the bottom but of course, there's your American dream, make American proud, buy American, hire American capitalism. And I think that's a women for Trump rally. But there you go, you can't have everything. Merton's highly critical of the driving social values in Western societies based on what he sees as competition and greed. And he suggests 
that this encourages individuals to break the law. So let's evaluate Merton. Starting with the strengths, well, he shows how both normal and deviant behaviour arises from the same goals. Conformists and innovators both pursue money success, but they do it by different means. One legal, another illegal. Merton explains the pattern shown in official statistics like these here. Most crime tends to be property crime because society values wealth so highly. Working class crime rates are higher because they have less opportunity to obtain wealth legitimately. And finally, just to look at the uh, limitations of Merton's theory. And for, we can argue that um, Merton ignores the crimes of the wealthy and also over predicts the amount of working class crime. So that's a clear weakness. And he also sees deviance solely as an individual response. And that completely ignores group deviance, particularly that group deviance of um, delinquent subcultures, gangs, that sort of stuff. And finally, Merton focuses on utilitarian crime. In other words, uh, crime that's really about um, gaining money, uh, theft, etc. And it ignores crime. Merton ignores crime with no economic motive, such as vandalism. And he doesn't really explain um, how crimes with no economic motive link into his theory at all. So that's another weakness. So that concludes our um, presentation on Durkheim and Merton. Hope you found it useful and I'll see you soon for our next sociological theory. Take care. Goodbye.